how how many of you uh, think you're going to be here throughout the week in the evenings? I, I know that's a hard one to know for sure. But some of you didn't, but how many can't be here? There, I could move ahead. I have a couple directions that I could go at this time. And um, if I knew that the, ma the majority of you were going were to ride this out all the way to the end together, that I would, I would do something here that I might not if I thought it was going to be the last time I've seen the majority of you. But the majority of the hands went up, okay? So uh, I, I know which way we're going here. And I think I gave for the hero in their own title, but that's all right. Um, I, I would like to spend a little bit of time here to make a point about Islam. And what, the reason I'm saying this, so you'll know, you might have a little bit of understanding about my confusion right now, is I would like to walk through this study of Islam in a very detailed, systematic fashion instead of running like the, the first couple of nights I did. We haven't been running tonight, but a couple of times I've had to. Um, and I'd like to make one point, but you really have to go a long way around the mountain to get there. But it's worth getting there. So bear with me. I, I probably am going to move fairly quickly anyway, but we're going to cover some ideas that you wouldn't necessarily expect it. And when we get to the end, we're just going to make it one small point about Islam, and then we'll make some larger points tomorrow night. Sister White, and, and I have the quotes for this. I'm not going to go to the quotes. Sister White says, we're supposed to understand the spiritual powers, and that we're supposed to teach the people that they're in controversy. And that's her words. And this, the spiritual powers, at least some of the spiritual powers in Bible prophecy, are the beast, the dragon, the false prophet. And the beast is the papacy, the dragon is the United Nations, and I submit, I have not proved that, but I'm still going to treat it that way, and perhaps we'll get an opportunity to prove that, how, at least how I understand it's proved later. And the false prophet is the United States. And the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet all have their own prophetic characteristics. They're, they're different, okay? Um, just in the triple application of prophecy that we showed with Elijah, you know, Jezebel, the papacy, is an impure woman. Uh, Ahab is the civil power, he's the king. And then you have a, a power that deceives, that does the dance of deception. So they all have their own characteristics. Um, when it comes to the papacy, the Bible and history and the papacy sa itself says that Rome never changes. The papacy never changes. Whereas the United States, the false prophet of Bible prophecy, that is its characteristic. It begins as a lamb, it ends up speaking as a dragon. It begins as Protestant America, it ends up as apostate Protestantism. The false prophet, he changes, okay? So there's, these powers all have their own characteristic. Rome never changes, the false prophet does. One of the characteristics of the, the papacy is, in Bible prophecy, it's in the city of Rome all the way to the end. I know that some people have speculative ideas that Rome's going to ultimately, the papacy is going to move to Jerusalem. But in Revelation 17, which is describing where the papacy comes down, she's still seated on the seven hill city of Rome. Rome is in the city of Rome all the way to the end. She never moves. And the false prophet, the United States, is in the United States all the way to the end. But the dragon. The dragon, that's what I would like to look at. The dragon moves through history. The dragon begins um, with Nimrod in the, in the plains of China, and he's, the dragon is there in Babylon with the Chaldeans, and the historians teach, and Adventist historians have noted uh, this in historical record, that when Babylon fell, the Chaldeans, the religious elite, fled from Babylon, and they moved to the city of Pergamos. Right. And in um, Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, it says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath a sharp sword with two edges, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. When Babylon fell, the Chaldeans moved to the city of Pergamos. Okay? And there was the, that's where Satan's seat was. 
Now, if you if you go to Daniel eight, now I won't give you I won't go give a study on the daily at this point in time. But if you uphold the pioneer position of the daily, then the daily in the book of Daniel represents paganism. And if you go to verse eleven of um, Daniel eight. And you approach verse 11, not as we do today in Adventism, but as the pioneers would. Verse 11 is speaking about pagan Rome. It says, Yea, he, pagan Rome, magnum, magnified himself even to the prince of the host. And whether you're a modern theologian or a pioneer, everyone agrees that the prince of the host here is Christ. And it's saying that in the pioneer approach, the correct approach, that pagan Rome would magnify itself against Christ attempt to kill him at his birth, participate in his crucifixion. They magnified themselves to the prince of the host. And by him, or from him, from pagan Rome, the daily paganism was taken away. And you'll see the daily um, here, and you'll also see the daily taken away in Daniel 11.31 and Daniel 12.11. But the Hebrew word in Daniel 11.31 and in Daniel 12.11 is sir. It means to remove. But the Hebrew word that's translated take away here in verse 11 does not mean to remove. It means to lift up and exalt. And Daniel uses this same Hebrew word in five other verses. And when the translators deal with it in the five other, other verses, they always use it to describe a lifting up and exaltation. So today... We read into it, unfortunately, that this word that says take away, we read into it remove. But in reality, if we would be consistent with the meaning of room, which is the Hebrew word, it's not sir, like 1131 or 1211, it's room. And the primary meaning of room is to lift up and exalt. If we would take the primary meaning of that word and then look at how Daniel used that word, and the word that room that is translated as take away here in verse 11 means to lift up and exalt. So verse 11 is saying that yea, pagan Rome magnified itself to Christ, and through pagan Rome, the religion of paganism was lifted up and exalted. And the place of pagan Rome sanctuary, his sanctuary, pagan Rome's sanctuary, was cast down. Not not the sanctuary. Okay? The modern theologians tell us that this sanctuary here is God's sanctuary in heaven. Okay, But if you look at the word sanctuary in verse 11, and then you look at verse 13 and 14, you will find in verse 13 and 14 that the word sanctuary is used in verse 13 and 14 also, within four verses. But the, the word sanctuary in verse 11 is a different Hebrew word that is translated as sanctuary in verses 13 and 14. And the word that's translated as sanctuary in verses 13 and 14 is Kodesh. And it, it is identifying in the Bible exclusively God's sanctuary. It's never used other than God's sanctuary in verse 13 and 14. But the word translated as sanctuary in verse 11 is Mikdash. And it can be either a pagan sanctuary or God's sanctuary, depending on context. So the fact that, that Daniel chooses two different words for sanctuary within four verses tells you they're not the same, same sanctuary. And the pioneers, that's how they relate to this verse. They're saying that pagan, pagan Rome magnified itself against Christ at his birth and his death, and they lifted up the religion of paganism. And the place where pagan Rome's sanctuary was located, which was the city of Rome, and pagan Rome sanctuary was the Pantheon temple. And the Pantheon, Pantheon means temple of the gods. It's where we get the word pantheism of the John Harvey Kellogg days. The Pantheon temple was located in the city of Rome, and that was the supreme point of paganism when pagan Rome ruled the world. That's why it was called pagan Rome. And it says the place of his sanctuary, the city of Rome, was cast down. And the pioneers understood that the city of Rome was cast down by the emperor Constantine in the year 330. He cast down the city of Rome because he wanted to move the capital to Constantinople. So the pioneers understood that this verse connects with all kinds of other passages in prophecy. But what I want you to see is this. When this verse says that pagan Rome 
which is translated take away, pagan Rome, the Hebrew word Rome, Rome, lifted up and exalted the religion of paganism, as the pioneers will tell you how pagan Rome lifted up and exalted paganism. And the way they did it was this. When they conquered a new country or city, if that nation or city was worshiping a pagan deity that they did not currently worship in Rome, then they would take the priests of that temple and the idols of that temple and they would move them back to the city of Rome and they would build them a room in the Pantheon temple and provide financing so they could continue that type of pagan worship. This was how pagan Rome lifted up and exalted paganism. So why am I telling you all that? I'm telling you for this reason. Paganism is the dragon power. Sister White plainly says, so we don't need Sister White, but she, she says so. She says, the dragon in Revelation 12 is Satan, but in a secondary sense, it is pagan Rome. Okay, the dragon power begins in Babylon. Babylon falls, the religious elite, the Chaldeans, they flee to Pergamos, and they set up shop in Pergamos. It becomes the place where Satan's seat is located, Satan, the dragon. But when Rome comes into history and it begins to conquer the world, there comes a point in time when it conquers the city of Pergamos. And when it conquers the city of Pergamos, it takes the Chaldeans, where Satan's seat is, and it moves them back to the Pantheon Temple. And what I want you to see is in Bible prophecy, the dragon power moves. He begins in battle, and he moves to Pergamos. Then he moves to the city of Rome, the Roman Empire. But... The Roman Empire, in history and in Daniel 7, turns into ten kingdoms, right? So the dragon power, he moves into these ten kingdoms. He's there. He's the, rep he's the representative of Europe today, okay? But, uh, it, it, but in any case, when you get into Daniel 11, verse 40, and you identify the king of the south as atheistic France, well, France is a descendant of the dragon power. But in verse 40, after the process of time, the King of the South changes from France to the Soviet Union, which is still the European, still the Dragon Tower. And when the King of the South comes down, the Dragon comes down, and where does he move? Where does go? When Gorbachev brings down the Soviet Union, where does he go to work? He immediately takes up a job in the United Nations. He moves to the United Nations, and the point is this: the Dragon Power which is also, we'll show you how it's symbolized in a different place. It moves through history. Rome's always in the city of Rome. The United States is always in the United States. But the dragon, it moves, okay? With, with that um, thought, let's go to, uh, let me get to my notes here. Ezekiel 37, I believe. <coughs> I have too many notes, and I'm not remembering this off the top of my head. Um, pardon me? No, no, that's why I said Ezekiel 37. That's popping in my head, and that's not right. Um, Oh, okay. All right, all right, all right. Got it. Um, let's look at Isaiah 7. I don't think it's Isaiah 7. It's not Isaiah 7. I'm sorry, I, I, this usually pops into my head at this point. Okay, go to Got it. 
Ezekiel 29. Okay, let me get to the verse. Ezekiel 29, verse 2. Son of man, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all Egypt. Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of the seas, which has said, My river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. Egypt is the dragon. Egypt is the dragon. Now, if you keep your finger there, let's remind us of something that we, we mentioned earlier this week that's probably left your mind if you weren't familiar with it already. Isaiah 44, um, verse 6 of Isaiah 44 says this. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God, and who is I shall call and shall declare it, and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. When Christ identifies his work of illustrating the end of something from the beginning of something, he says that part of his work in accomplishing this is that he appointed the ancient people, and one of the ancient people that he appointed was Egypt. If you go back to Ezekiel 29, Egypt is also the dragon. Egypt is a symbol of the dragon. And of course, um, this, is, this is not a stretch. When you're going to identify who the king of the south is, you have to go, in order to identify the power that rules atheism, you've got to go to Egypt, you've got to go to the Pharaoh. There's a direct connection with everything that we've already said. But stay in Ezekiel 29 and go to um, verse 18 to 29. I want, I want to show you something that the Bible teaches here. Son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to serve a great service against Tyrus. Every head was made bald and every shoulder was filled, yet he had no wages nor his army for Tyrus for the service that he <laughs> served against it. What the Bible is teaching here, and this is not the only place the Bible teaches this, is that Babylon, when it, when it conquered Israel and carried it into Babylon, when it did that work, even though it wasn't a holy nation, the Lord relates to Babylon as his chastening rod, as something that he uses to accomplish a work. And in the Bible it teaches that for the work that Babylon accomplishes, that the Lord is going to pay him. He's going to give him his wages. Notice the next verse. Verse 19 says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt unto Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take her multitude, and take her spoil, and take her prey, and it shall be the wages for his army. For Babylon's service, the Lord gives Babylon, Egypt to Babylon. For Babylon's service, the Lord gives the dragon to Babylon. Next verse, I have given him the land of Egypt for his labor, wherewith he served against it because they brought for me, saith the Lord God. Now there's other places in the scriptures where you can see that the Lord says that he will give Egypt to Babylon for his service. Go to, I'll show you one more, and then we'll go back to Revelation. Um, in Daniel 11, verse 40 and onward, the, the subject of verses 40 to 45 is the king of the north, and the king of the north at the end of the world is the papacy. I haven't proved that to you, but it's very provable. It is, I believe, foundational to Adventism. Um, James White understood and believed from the very beginning that the King of the North in Daniel 11 was the papal power, and in the, one of the very first publications after 1844 called The Words of the Little Flock, you can see James White there identifying that the King of the North in Daniel 11 is the papacy. So it was understood from the very beginning and it continued to be understood until Uriah Smith introduced the King of the North as Turkey in the 1870-1880 time period. But not even the modern theologians and Adventism accept that anymore. The King of the North is the papacy. I know I didn't prove it to you, but if the King of the North is the papacy, and it is, verses 40 and onward is describing how the modern Rome, how the deadly wound is healed, and you'll notice and in verse 42, when the king of the north 
makes um, his next point of conquest in verse 22, it says, And he, the king of the north, Babylon, modern Babylon, shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. Egypt is given to Babylon in Bible prophecy. Egypt is the dragon. All right, so go to Revelation 17. Okay, we've got a few minutes. This isn't a, this won't be a thorough presentation of Revelation 17. I want to just put a couple points in place. In Revelation 17, verse 1, it says, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials. And the seven vials are the seven last plagues. And the seven last plagues have been poured out in chapter 16. So in the first verse of chapter 17, when it says, and one of the angels came unto John that had the seven vials. There is a purposeful connection being made between Revelation 16, where we have the seven last plagues, and Revelation 17. Which means to the student of prophecy that if we're going to understand Revelation 17 correctly, then we must seek some type of connection between these two chapters. If the Lord didn't want us to see that type of connection, it just would have been an angel that came to John. But in verse 1, it says it was an angel that had one of the seven vials, and the seven vials were in the previous chapter. And perhaps, prophetically, in terms of symbolism, the most important thing is in Revelation 16 is no doubt the fact that we are warned to make sure that we have Christ's righteousness as this is all coming to pass. Um, you can see it in verse 15 of Revelation 16. It says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keepeth his garment, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. That's probably the most important verse for my human understanding. I probably shouldn't prioritize God's word. But at least next to that is the fact that Revelation 16 tells us that modern Babylon is divided into three parts, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. We need to understand at the end of the world that modern Babylon isn't simply the Roman church, it's not simply Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar's day and age, but Babylon at the end of the world is three parts, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. So when we come into Revelation 17, after the angel comes to show John the judgment of the papacy in verse 1, in verse 3 it says, So he carried me away into the spirit, in the spirit into the wilderness. So the wilderness is identified upon the testimony of 2 in Revelation chapter 12. And in verse 6 of Revelation 12, it says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And in verse 14, you'll see a second testimony to the wilderness. It says, And to the woman were given the two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. The wilderness is the 1260 years of papal rule, and in verse 3, John is carried into that history. John received the vision around the year 100, and in order for him to see the vision of the papal church, he has to go forward in history. He has to go into the history where the papal church exists. The papal church is ruling the world from 538 to 1798, during this 1260 year time period, which is verse 6 and verse 14 of Revelation 12 says of the wilderness. So the first thing that I want to mark here is that John's carried to the 1260 year time period to receive this vision, but he's not simply carried to the 1260 year time period. In verse 4, when he gets there, he sees a woman in verse 3. Um, and in verse Five, it says, of this woman, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So when he goes into the 1260 year time period, and he sees the woman, which is the Roman church, he sees her when she's already drunk with the blood of persecution. He sees her right at the end of the 1260 years, because she's already drunk with the blood of persecution. And her title is that she's the mother of harlots, meaning that the Protestant Reformation has already began, and some of the Protestant churches have not come, kept up with the light, and prophetically, they
they've already become daughters of her, and she's the mother of harlots already. So we know that in this vision, that John is carried right down here to the end of this time period. And we have to know this, because there's a riddle that says five have fallen, one is, and one is yet to come. And where you place John in history is going to determine how you understand the riddle. And Revelation 17 is very careful to tell us where John is in history. He's carried to the wilderness, but he's not simply carried to the wilderness. He's carried to the very end of that history when the papacy is already drunk with the blood of persecution. So some of you getting a little bit tired. We only have 12 minutes, so if you can hang in there. Um, in verse... I, we're all familiar with, with reading through Revelation 17, all right? I'm, I'm leaving out a lot of details, because I want to make one point about Egypt, all right? And then Islam. In, the angel's going to tell John the mystery of the beast and the woman. And by the time you get to verse 10, it says, And there are seven kings. And a king in Bible prophecy is a kingdom. And Sister White says over and over again in different ways that the books of Daniel and Revelation are the same book. Just as the same line of prophecy that's in the book of Daniel is in the book of Revelation. They bring each other to perfection. So when John says there's seven kings, the kingdoms of Bible prophecy have been established in the book of Daniel. The kingdoms of Bible prophecy, we all know this. I don't know why I put that line there. The first is Babylon. The second is Medo-Persia. The third is Greece. The fourth is what? Pagan Rome. And the fifth is Papal Rome. I never put that line there. I don't know how to do that. Um, and in verse 10, and there are seven kings, five are fallen. So here's what we're suggesting about this. John is here. He's carried to the end of the wilderness time period. He's carried to 1798. He's carried to right here at the end of the papacy ruling the world. And he sees seven kings, five of which have fallen. In agreement with the book of Daniel, the five that are fallen are Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Pagan Rome, and Papal Rome. In 1798, one is. And we were... We were just in France this year. It was, a, it was a while ago, and I asked some questions. And I was amazed that the French people, they got, they got three of these four questions. I, just didn't, I couldn't believe that they would get three of these four questions. So I'm going to ask you the same four questions. In the United States, we never get all of them. We, never usually, we usually don't get three of these four questions. We'll see if we can do it tonight. And France did three out of four. <laughs> when was the Declaration of Independence? There's one. When was the Constitution? 1789. Everyone agree with him? Uh, 1787. Close. Right. When was the Bill of Rights? The Frenchman had been studying American history. It was 1791. But, here's my question. When did the nations of Europe officially recognize the United, Nation, the United States as a sovereign nation? 1798. In 1798, the one that is, is the USA. And the verse says, and, it, and there's other ways to show this, we're moving quickly to make the point, and the other is not yet come. The seventh hasn't yet come into history. And you can show by the grammatical structure, brothers and sisters, that the seventh is the ten horns, okay, the ten kings. Because the seventh kingdom has not yet come. And you go to verse 12, and it says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet. They have not come. Whoever the seventh kingdom is, it is the ten horns, because they have not yet come. And in Adventism, sometimes, we like to say the ten kings are this pagan Rome back here in this history that divided into ten kingdoms. But it can't be that because they have not yet come. And because it says in verse 12, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet. When these ten horns receive a kingdom, it's a singular kingdom. When these ten horns of pagan Rome disintegrated into ten kingdoms, there was ten kingdoms. 
But the seventh kingdom is ten horns that receive a single kingdom. And I'm submitting to you that that's the United Nations. It's the ten kings. It's uh, in, in the story of the three Elijahs that we did tonight, this, the papal Rome, papal Rome, well, papal Rome, the deadly duty he killed is the eighth, okay? Modern Rome. That's the Vatican. Has to be Rome. It has to be Rome. But what we're saying is, in the story of the three Elijahs, the number eight, since the eighth is of the seventh, that's Jezebel. Jezebel connected with the civil power, that's the United Nations, that's Ahab. And what was Ahab the king over? The ten northern kingdoms, okay? Ten northern tribes. The ten northern tribes. What do you, what do you say to that for? Israel. Israel was the ten northern tribes. Okay? <coughs> Jerusalem, Judah, that's the two southern. And the prophets of Baal is the United States, it's the false prophet that does the dance of, dance of deception. In fact, that's why the angel that came to give John the vision is noted as coming from Revelation 16, because the United States is the false prophet. The United Nations is the dragon. And this is the beast. We, if we're going to understand Revelation 17 correctly, we have to understand it in connection with Revelation 16. <clears throat> and Revelation 17 is not telling us who the 6th, 7th, and 8th kingdom are. It's telling us how the final kingdom of Earth's history comes together. And the final kingdom of Earth's history is a threefold union of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. So this sequence is telling us who the three parts are. The false prophet, the dragon, the beast. So they're really all part of the same kingdom. The final kingdom. And the final kingdom is the sixth kingdom. So the United States is part of the sixth kingdom. The United Nations is part of the sixth kingdom. And the papacy is part of the sixth kingdom. But what is it? The United Nations is one of the room. And we've got more to say about Revelation 17 later. We have much more defense to make on Revelation 17 that I haven't made. But I want to make one point here. This is where we went around the mountain to get to. The ten horns are the United Nations. They are the civil power. They are Ahab. They're the king, all right, that, that comes into an unlawful relationship with the papacy because the United States insists for that to happen. The United States forces the world to come under the umbrella of a one world government with the papacy ruling that one world government as the moral authority. And why do they do so? Well, number one, in, in verse 17, of Revelation 17, speaking of the ten kings, it says, For God hath put it in their hearts, the ten kings, to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be finished. My brothers and sisters, the Bible teaches that Egypt, the dragon power, is given to modern Babylon. And here it's happening. These ten kings are the dragon power. They're Egypt. And Bible prophecy says that Egypt is given to Babylon. And Babylon is the beast, okay? So the question is, why? Why does the civil power, the ten kings, paganism, agree to give their kingdom to the papacy at the end of the world? And the, the, the point in that question that I hope you heard was, end. The end of the world. Jesus illustrates the end of a thing with the beginning of a thing. If you want to know why the civil power is given to the papacy at the end of the world, then you ask yourself, why was it, how was it, that the civil power was given to the papacy the first time? Because if you go to Revelation 13, verse 2, Verse 2 of Revelation 13 says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as, a, were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, and the dragon here is pagan wrong. It's the same dragon as chapter 12 that leads into chapter 13. And Sister White in Great Controversy tells us this dragon is pagan wrong. And this is the pioneer approach to this. The dragon, pagan Rome, gave three things to the papacy. 
gave power, seat, and authority. These are three historical events. The power that was given to the papacy was given from the year 496 onward as Clovis, king of France, brought his military and economic strength to the aid of the papacy and began the work of placing her upon the throne of the earth. And the kings of Europe continued to support the papacy with their military and economic support through the 1260 years. But in 496, Clovis, king of France, was converted to Catholicism and he gave his power to the papacy and it continued through history. Pagan Rome gave its seat to the papacy in the year 330 when the Emperor Constantine moved the capital of the empire out of the city of Rome to Constantinople, leaving a power vacuum in the city of Rome that the Roman Church was capable and did just gobble up. And the seat was given to them. But pagan Rome gave its civil authority, its great authority, to the papacy in the year 533 in the decree of Justinian. And in the decree of Justinian, a legal document, the emperor of Eastern Rome identifies the Pope of Rome as two things, the corrector of heretics and the head of the churches. And that is the first time that papal Rome was given the civil authority. And Jesus illustrates the end with the beginning in Bible prophecy. So if you want to know why the dragon in Revelation 17, the ten kings of Egypt, agrees to give their civil authority, their kingdom, to the papacy at the end of the world, you simply have to go back to the year 533 and ask yourself, why was the civil authority given to the papacy then? And all you have to do is read Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith or other similar books to find out that the reason that Justinian agreed, found himself in that situation was two things. two things. Number one, you're in the year 533. In the year 321, Constantine passes the first Sunday law, and then in the year 330, he divides the emperor, empire into east and west, and the, the Roman Empire begins to crumble as the trumpets of Revelation begin to roll. First four trumpets, by the year 476, the first four trumpets have totally decimated the Western Empire and it's turned into ten kingdoms. So that's 476. By the time you get to 533, over 50 years later, the trumpets are still blowing and the kingdom is still being brought to its knees and the emperor Justinian, he's dealing with an empire that's falling apart. And why is it falling apart? because of escalating warfare that's being brought by a trumpet power. And he was trying to con consolidate his political clout in order to keep his kingdom together because it was falling apart. He had another crisis going on. The other crisis was religious. And that crisis was, was the church in Constantinople the preeminent Christian church or was the church in Rome the preeminent Christian church? And in the midst of his kingdom, his whole world falling apart from the trumpet powers blowing, he decided it was politically expedient for him to decide to identify the Pope of Rome as the head of all the churches and the corrector of heretics. And he put it into a legal document called the Decree of Justinian. And as soon as he did, the Pope of Rome had the legal right to turn around to him and say, you're a heretic, off with your head. He had given the civil authority away to the papacy. So brothers and sisters, when you get to Revelation 17 and you see these ten kings and the dragon power, they're the civil authority, they're Egypt, and they agree to give their civil authority to the papacy at the end of the world, and you know that Jesus illustrates the end of the thing from the beginning of the thing, all you have to do is go back to this history and look at the recorded history, look at how the pioneers understood it and commented on it, and you can tell yourself this. When the United Nations gives its civil authority over the papacy, it says, we're the, we're the one world structure, but we're going to let you rule as the moral authority over this civil structure. The reason they're going to do so 
is because the world is going to be being brought to its knees by a trumpet power. And there's going to be a religious crisis going on. And the religious crisis is the trumpet power. The seventh trumpet, the third woe, is Islam. And it's doing the work right now of bringing planet Earth to its knees. And it's creating a situation since 9-11 that's going to bring about the Sunday law in the United States. And then the United States is going to go to the world and say the only way that we can deal with radical Islam is to bring the world under the one world government of the United Nations. And there's going to be an agreement struck that in order to make that work, we need to have a great moral authority directing traffic. And the Pope of Rome is going to be that moral authority. And he's going to be put on the head of the threefold union as the corrector of heretics. And brothers and sisters, in the story of the three Elijahs, if you remember, if you remember, I mentioned it. When Ahab went to Jezebel and he said, you would not believe what I saw in Carmel today. Elijah's God is the true God. Ahab did not think that Jezebel was going to say Elijah's going to be dead by tomorrow. Now, Ahab was prefiguring Herod. And when Herod saw the wonderful dance of Salome, and says, up to half my kingdom for that wonderful dance, he did not think that Salome was going to do his, her, his, her mother's will and say, what I want for that dance is John the Baptist's head. See, the dragon power, Herod, Ahab, they're deceived. The United Nations is deceived by Jezebel and Herodias in this situation. And it's already been identified in the world. Brothers and sisters, when the United States and Iraq captured Saddam Hussein, there was an argument that went on on planet Earth. And the argument was, do we try Saddam Hussein in an Iraqi court or a United States court, or do we try him in the world court? Because in Iraq and the United States, they believe in the death penalty. But the world court doesn't believe in the death penalty. And when they first captured Saddam Hussein, if you watch the news, there was an argument going on. Where does he get tried? Does he get tried in Iraq, the United States, or does he get go to Europe and get tried by the European? At that time period, the last pope, not this one, he started coming out with letters. And you know what he said? You know what Jezebel said? You know what Herodias said? She says, you need to try Saddam Hussein in the world court because we don't believe in the death penalty. <laughs> the United Nations was being led to believe that Jezebel doesn't believe in the death penalty. It's already playing out. The United Nations is already being deceived about the motives of Jezebel because when she's finally put on position of the United Nations as the moral authority, the United Nations is going to wake up too late to find that she could care less about radical Islam. She wants Elijah, and she's going to turn on God's people. And this history is unfolding, and this history is what's identified in Bible prophecy, and this is the message that Seventh-day Adventists need to come to grips with very quickly because time is running out. The third world has begun, and Islam is a subject of Bible prophecy, and you and I as Seventh-day Adventists really don't have any spiritual authority to argue about that because it has been represented on those charts which just what Bible says was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered. Islam as a subject of Bible prophecy is foundational. And those of us that don't understand it, it's time to get back on the platform because probation is about to close. Should we pray? Heavenly Father, we wish to be among those that are represented by Elijah, John the Baptist, that give a faithful testimony in a crisis time, that we understand who and what we are at the end of the world, and we're sleeping virgins, we're Laodiceans, we're a valley of dry bones. We need to be awakened to who we are and what our need is. We, we ask that you would do that in each of our lives, that you would bring us to life. But we understand that you've given evidence through the Bible and the spirit of prophecy that the way you intend to awaken us is through your prophetic word. Give us the discernment, the willingness, the energy to take up the work of being students of prophecy, of being Bereans, that we can understand what you're saying to the church at this time and get up on the wall with a sword in one hand and a, a work implement in the other and not get down 
Building things good ones, we ask in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.